Tuesday, October 8, 2020, coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered. We'll break down last night's vice presidential debate between Kamala Harris, Senator Kamala Harris, and Mike Pence. Oh, we've got some highlights for you. White domestic terrorists arrested for the plot to kidnap and murder the governor of Michigan, Governor Gretchen Whitmer. And what does the Donald Trump campaign do? They blast her. The police investigative file into the Breonna Taylor uh, shooting has been released. Also, Donald Trump's Twitter army is uh, strategically canceling anti-Trump ads. We're going to show you some of those ads. Uh, folks, it is time to bring the funk of Roland Martin Unfiltered. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. Yeah, yeah. It's on go, 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 y'all. Yeah, yeah. It's rolling, Martin. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Rolling with rolling now. Yeah, yeah. He's funk, he's fresh, he's real, the best you know. He's rolling, Martin. The one and only debate between Vice President Mike Pence and Senator Kamala Harris took place last night in Utah, Salt Lake City, Utah. The University of Utah sparks certainly flew between both sides on the stage. A range of issues, including the coronavirus pandemic, climate change, the issue of race as well. Here is a roundup. And they knew what was happening and they didn't tell you. Can you imagine if you knew on January 28th, as opposed to March 13th, what they knew, what you might have done to prepare? They knew and they covered it up. The president said it was a hoax. They minimized the seriousness of it. The president said, you're on one side of his ledger. If you wear a mask, you're on the other side of his ledger if you don't. And in spite of all of that, today they still don't have a plan. They still don't have a plan. Well, Joe Biden does. And quite frankly, when I look at their plan that talks about advancing testing, creating new PPE, developing a vaccine. Um, it looks a little bit like plagiarism, which is something Joe Biden knows a little bit about. Vice also President say, Pence, the Vice American President people Pence, deserve, you know, Susan, the American Pence, people deserve I didn't to know. Uh, there, Vice President that, Pence, I did not, excuse me, Susan, the I did not create the rules for tonight. Joe Biden. You, you, your campaigns Trump, agreed to the rules for tonight's I, debate I, with I, the Commission on Presidential Debates. I'm here to enforce them which involves moving from one topic to another, giving roughly equal time to both of you, right which ahead. is what I'm trying very hard to Go do. Go right ahead. I mean, I thought we saw enough of it in last week's debate, but I think this is supposed to be a debate based on fact and truth. And the truth and the fact is, Joe Biden has been very clear. He will not raise taxes on anybody who makes less than $400,000 a year. He said he's going to repeal the Trump tax cuts. Uh, Mr. Vice President, I'm speaking. Well, wait, wait. I'm speaking. With regard to the Supreme Court of the United States. Let me say, President Trump and I could not be more enthusiastic about the opportunity to see Judge Amy Coney Barrett become Justice Amy Coney Barrett. We hope she gets a fair hearing. And we particularly hope that we don't see the kind of attacks on her Christian faith that we saw before. Joe Biden and I are both people of faith. And it's insulting su to suggest that we would knock anyone for their faith. There's the issue of choice, and I will always fight for a woman's right to make a decision about her own body. It should be her decision and not that of Donald Trump and, and the vice president, Michael Pence. I'll just tell you, this, this, this presumption that you hear consistently uh, from Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, that, uh, that America is systemically racist, mm. and that, as Joe Biden said, that he believes that law enforcement has an implicit bias against minorities is, is a great insult to the men and women who serve in law enforcement. I will not sit here and be lectured by the vice president on what it means to enforce the laws of our country. I am the only one on this stage who has personally prosecuted everything from child sexual assault to homicide. I'm the only one on this stage who has prosecuted the big banks for taking advantage of America's homeowners. I'm the only one on this stage who prosecuted for profit colleges for taking advantage of our veterans. And the reality of this is 
that we are talking about an election in 27 days where last week the President of the United States took a debate stage in front of 70 million Americans and refused to condemn white supremacists. All right, let's talk about it. Eric Savage Wilson, host of Savage Politics Podcast. Dr. Greg Carr, Chair of the Department of Afro-American Studies, Howard University, Reese Covert, Black Women's Views. Reese, start with you. Uh, I take it uh, you were pleased with how uh, your candidate did last night? Absolutely. She was stellar, superb, brilliant, historic, magnificent, intelligent, commanding. I could go on and on and on, obviously. She just did such a spectacular job. She obviously had a very high bar that was set for her. And by every even objective measure, whether you look at the polling or you look at the fundraising numbers, she knocked it out of the park. And her opponent sat there with pink eye and a fly on his head, barely being able to breathe after a couple of words at a time, and lied, deflected, and pivoted the entire time. But what Kamala Harris did, Senator Kamala Harris did, was she did the number one thing she set out to do. Number one, she was there to amplify and and, and boost uh, Joe Biden. And number two, she was there to eviscerate Donald Trump and prosecute the case against the Trump and Pence administration, which has been a complete failure. She was the only person who had a grasp on reality, not the alternate reality that Pence and, and Donald Trump like to portray. And she was very strong in terms of explaining that Moody's determined that the the, the Biden Harris administration would give would have seven million more jobs, that they would not raise taxes on anybody making less than four hundred thousand dollars a year, that they believe climate change is an existential threat, and that they will do something about it. They will not allow Putin to put Russian bounties on troops' heads. That they will do the opposite of what Trump and Pence have done, which is appoint monolithically white, young, male, unqualified judges. And it goes on, and especially I thought that she was incredibly strong on Breonna Taylor, which we're going to talk about later, and being unequivocal that not only did Breonna Taylor not not receive the justice that she deserved, but that they're going to do something to prevent this kinds of things that continues to happen, the implicit bias, the systemic racism in our criminal justice system. They're going to they're going to do something about it. Mike, Michael, Mike Pence has no plan. Donald Trump has no plan. They've been a disaster. And it was loud and clear that Kamala Harris and Joe Biden do, and more importantly, that Kamala Harris is ready to step in on day one as president, if need be, at whatever point that might need to be the, the situation. Erica. Absolutely. I totally agree with my sister, Reese. She laid it out plainly for the audience. And this was not a debate um, really to be had. This was about informing the American people what they can expect from a Biden-Harris administration. And particularly since we're in a very triggering environment where we have a person, the son of a Klansman, who is the executive leader at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue that is going about the business of the day shooting infomercials, talking about how great he feels because he's hocked up on steroids, that we still have 200, over 211,000 people that are dead because of COVID-19. And there is still, as Reese has already shared, there's still not a plan in place to combat COVID. When you think about the EPA regulations that have been rolled back and the air pollution, the different people that have been placed in administrative positions that really are doing the very opposite of protecting the American people. So I think what people saw was uh, confidence. People saw um, a strong leader um, under the incredible pressures that our country is in. And I think what people saw, particularly for unregistered voters, because I just don't believe that they're undecided voters, that they actually have an administration um, quality leaders to um, register to vote for. Uh, I think uh, we had, uh, of course, post-debate analysis last night, Greg, with um, a group of black women. Uh, and I said this here, that last night, the job of Senator Kamala Harris was to do no harm. And that is, after the first debate, you saw exactly what happened, where the polling numbers went up for Joe Biden because of how disastrous Donald Trump was. Of course, Mike Pence was going to be how he normally is, very calm, totally different demeanor and tone than Donald Trump. Doesn't mean you're not going to lie, but again, you come off differently. I do believe, Greg, that there were there were several moments uh, last night uh, where where uh, Senator Harris could have been a lot tougher on Mike Pence uh, and a lot more precise in going after them, uh, especially when he when he criticized her when he said she had not lifted a finger on the first step act. I thought that was a moment where, and I've been saying this here. I think Democrats. Let me be real clear. Democrats have been making a grave mistake 
by not talking about the role that they played in the First Step Act. Okay? Mm -hmm. If it wasn't for what her, Senator Cory Booker, Senator Dick Durbin, uh, any Republican Chuck Grassley did in the Senate, the bill would not have been improved. That's, I was sitting there going, please say, I'm tired of y'all taking credit for the work of Democrats. But, mm -hmm. but she didn't. And he literally said, you didn't lift a finger. Then, uh, Greg, I also, when, when he said, when he criticized uh, over the, uh, the Tim Scott bill, uh, and then mm -hmm. I was just hoping, I was like waiting for her saying, I'm sorry, uh, I wanted to debate in the Senate Judiciary, but where were you on the anti-lynching bill? Where we, see, mm -hmm. it, it, because what he saw what he did, Greg, he went to her record because he was trying to talk to black men. When he criticized her record, it was all about black men. And then, and she didn't respond to it in terms of her, her attack on her record. That was a moment where I was like, yo, hit him back, hit him back. But I think they said, don't be angry, smile, do no harm. Your thoughts? I agree. In fact, everything that has been said so far, I think, uh, is, of, is of a seamless whole. Uh, Reese laid out the substantive uh, case for Senator Harris's excellent performance last night. And Erica has uh, not only enhanced that case, but extended it in terms of what the objective was. And you and you as well. I mean, her number one objective is do no harm. You know, as a person who laughs a lot, and who smiles a lot, I, I actually felt bad for Senator Harris last night because clearly the straight jacket that the Democratic Party put her in, uh, by the way, Democratic Party, um, a losing straight jacket. Uh, of civility, I understand. She's under terrible constraints as a woman, as a black woman, and then have the Democratic Party that has never learned how to fight, the white nationalist party, uh, that seems to think they're engaged in a boxing match that they can win on points, as opposed to coming into the ring with people who have slabs and, and nunchucks and bare knuckled, uh, brass knuckles, mm -hmm. and then they want to come and box and act like they can. Yeah. Some, there's some kind of referee that's going to give them a, an award on points. By the way, Susan Page, great job. Go sit next to Chris Wallace, particularly you coming out of USA Today. Anybody who's been reading your byline for years know that you own Team mm. Pence. But at any rate, um, you know, I felt bad a little bit for Senator Harris because it took until that turning point in the clip that you played where she said, hold on, I will not be last year. At that point, I said, oh, maybe we're getting ready to see Kamala Harris. Because clearly what Biden and them have told you to do is go there and then her natural demeanor is to kind of smile, smile at Mike Pence who sat there, and again, I tell you, I love him, because uh, Smile Mike Pence is, is the worst kind of white nationalist, who sat there with mm. his uh, projectile stream of vomit lies. And by the way, those plexiglass shields were useless. But as far as, you know, you got 14 days to figure out whether Smile and Mike Pence has is, 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 is got COVID or not. And this thing can be projected up to 16 feet in the air. So those, that was just theater right there. Well, that first of all, the reason anybody. we know that, uh, Vice President Mike Pence canceled the trip with him and his wife to Indiana. Uh, and all of a sudden abruptly canceled that schedule and they not cleared the schedule. It, no question, because I'm sure he's going to come out and say he has it. I mean, so, I mean, you know, so first of all, she put her life at risk and, uh, and to sit there and to be under that projectile vomit of smiling Mike Pence, who is a liar to his DNA, even more yes. so than Donald Trump. Because see, smiling Mike Pence is a Christian nationalist. And a white Christian nationalist terrorist mm -hmm. like that think there's no place for women in any dialogue. You know, I mean, he calls his wife mother, right? So you know what that makes him. <laughs> but at any rate, right. the, the whole idea is that she had to sit there and try to be balanced. And when you're dealing with something like that in that straight jacket of, uh, of civility, you might lose sight, Democratic Party, of the point. The debate, Smiler Mike Pence is talking to his white nationalist base. And as you say, those black men who might be confused out there, Smiling Mike Pence needs to pick a few of you off enough to get this thing close enough to steal. See, that's what Smiling Mike Pence was doing. And the only honest broker who went out to Smiling Mike Pence last night was that damn fly. And if you want to know who was listening <laughs> to the conversation like we're having right now, understand that the victor of that debate last night, the one that everybody's talking about while we're actually talking about the substantive issues, are the people on social media tweeting pictures of a fly landing on his head? Uh, look, I think smiling like this, ain't I, no debate. This I, is all entertainment. I think when we talk about um, again, I, I look, we've seen Senator Kamala Harris questioning folks uh, on the yes. Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, and the and the reality is uh, there, there could have a far more aggressive prosecution. But again, I think and then, but, but here's what you also have, and we have to be straight up honest: you're still dealing with a nation where. Other industrialized nations have elected women leaders and not the United States. 
the Frank Luntz right. group of undecided voters when he was on the Fox News. Oh, she was nasty. She was this. Because that, again, that's what happens. And, and look, I, I don't know what the hell Susan Page was doing, but, but I'm going to tell you right now, the way you stop somebody from over-talking you is not saying, thank you, Mr. Vice President. Thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Vice President. Thank you. No. Susan Page needs to go sit with a black woman for 24 <laughs> hours to learn how to shut somebody down, to learn how to say, excuse me, you have gone over your time one too many times. That is it. And he just bulldozed her in this very nice, wonderful you know, calm way. And I was sitting and I was like, Reese, I was like, if this woman don't check his ass, but see, that's, but let me tell you what Reese, that's that DC bullshit. See, that's mm -hmm. that, that's that whole, you know, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to sit uh -huh. here, you know, because what, what's the right going to say? And no, yeah. you're the moderator. Right. Moderate. Yeah. I mean, I actually think that she had great questions. I will give her that. But your job isn't just to sit there and ask questions. Your job is to control the pace, the timing, and make sure that it's fair and that people actually stay on topic, which she epically failed at. But at the end of the day, I mean, I think that the numbers speak for themselves. I mean, there was polling that came out. Nate Silver said that 69.3% of the poll of the people who watched the debate felt like Kamala Harris did a great job. That's practically 100%, because we know that 30% of this country is hopelessly Republican and a lost cause. Her job last night was not to beat Mike Pence. Her job was to beat Donald Trump. People are not voting for Mike Pence. People are voting for Donald Trump. And so I think that she was wise to, to pick and choose when she wanted to engage on, on Mike Pence. She gave him a gut punch with the whole auto bailout and pointing out that he did not, that he voted against that. Absolutely. But for the most part, she kept her focus on Donald Trump, which everybody is not, ha most people are not happy with. He has, his, his ratings are in the gutter. His favorabilities are in the gutter. Yeah. And what I think Kamala Harris understood is that you have to win the the post debate game. A lot of times Kamala was excellent on the stage, but she lost the spin wars after, and she lost the pundits and things like that. Yep. Those are the people that are going to curate the clips that you mm -hmm. see on social media, the clips that go into the news things. And one of the biggest things that people focus on in these kind of debates is who's interrupting who. Who's going over on time and this, that, and the other. So I think that her strategy to stick within the rules, even though she obviously was gypped on time because Susan Page did a terrible job, she was much more succinct than Kamala is. And I love Kamala, but Kamala can be a little long-winded, but she was very succinct. She got very strong, memorable talking points where they're coming for you is one of them. I'm speaking is mm -hmm. another one of them. So her job is not to sit up there and assert herself as the biggest, baddest bitch that ever walked the work, the world. Her job is there to bolster the, the, the Biden Harris ticket and annihilate Donald Trump. Mike Pence is a non-factor. Absolutely. Right, well, here's the deal. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the debate, but uh, I wanted to, I want to do this. Uh, well, first of all, we, uh, we got Greg back there. So let me do this here. Uh, it was uh, a bit ago, uh, uh, Joe Biden and uh, Senator Kamala Harris, they were actually uh, in uh, Arizona uh, where they were uh, kicking off uh, their bus tour. Uh, and so what I'm going to do for in a second, I'm going to pull that up. But, but But one of the things that I think uh, that has to happen, and, and, and we're seeing we're seeing what's happening after this whole uh, debate, uh, Erica, uh, Greg, and, and Reese, in terms of how Donald Trump is just losing his damn mind, mm -hmm. saying um, uh, to Bill Barr, indict Joe Biden with 26 days left before the election. Uh, then you see, of course, uh, just how unhinged they are in every in, in every facet. This is the thing, Erica, that I am going to have to see from Democrats, and look. I know what Joe Biden is doing. I know his whole deal is unity, bringing the country together. But the reality is this here. The evil that these people have unleashed on this country yes. is going, has damaged us in a significant way. And I, and I will say this, if you are a Trump voter, you should pay holy hell for supporting what okay. this man is doing. And what we saw last night, again, uh, the nonsense coming out of Mike Pence's mouth uh, over and over and over again, I really hope that Joe Biden 
and Senator Kamala Harris, when they are in the White House, are going to be real to say, we are going to deal with all of these people, how they have destroyed this country, how they have lied about this country. There are folks who need to go to jail. There are folks who yeah. need to be uh, indicted. I mean, I can just go on and on and on here. That, I mean, again, what these people have done, Erica, is an abomination to democracy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I think that's why, you know, people repeatedly hear on this program from all of us and across the RMU family is that he is a demagogue. He's the son of a Klansman. This is the type of evil that we um, were expecting, particularly when he came down that uh, golden escalator back in 2015. And then when we think back to January in 2016, when he was still a candidate, said in Iowa that he could shoot um, a person on Fifth Avenue and people would still support him. I'm paraphrasing what he said. So now we speed up to here we are in October. And as you always say, Roland, please, everybody, don't pay attention to the poll. There's polling that's coming out that's showing that there's a wide gap in Florida, which always uh, usually goes Republican in Colorado and other uh, swing states and battleground states. But if we just think back to a four short years ago where we saw polling that showed Hillary Clinton being up and we saw favorable margins, some up by um, almost 7.1 um, seven, uh, points um, uh, ahead. So I think that, particularly when we have five and a half million people who've already cast ballots, it is really eyes on the prize. It's heads down. Let mainstream media do what they do, because they're going to continue to do that. They're going to continue to talk out of both sides of their mouth. They're going to continue to talk to these uh, supposed undecided voters. What we have to do as a collective is really make sure if you're still in a place where you can register to vote, that you're registered to vote. Make sure, as Dr. Carr says, put five on it. Make sure you have five other people that you're having these conversations with around ensuring that they're registered to vote and if they're not registering them to vote. And people get out and vote early, whether that's vote by mail or voting in person, because this particular regime wants nothing more than continue to, as you said, run this country in the ground, wants to isolate it from the globe. We're already seeing how the New England Journal of Medicine, which is an apolitical um, um, arm, that is saying, listen, you, we have a political incompetent people. And so we have got to get people that have a level of competency and that believe in science that are leading the American people. So they, the first 100 days, I agree with you, Roland, there definitely needs to be um, on that memo, prosecution of people that have uh, caused harm, um, uh, people that have marched people right up into the grave. And really, we have to look forward that this is not just, you know, a, a, an election. We're talking about decades um, of repair that needs to be done. Um, what, we, uh, what we also, I think, witnessed last night, we witnessed, uh, Greg, uh, in, in terms of uh, when you look at, when you look at the issues, uh, when you look at, uh, especially on law and order. I mean, what you heard was Mike Pence saying, I don't give a damn about the rest of y'all out here. Folks are being shot. We are going to stand with cops. Uh, he criticized Harris as well as Biden for the criticism of police. Uh, and, 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 and again, uh, that was one of those, th that was one of those things where I was hoping, I was just hoping she was going to say, do you even care about the victims of police brutality. Do you even care about that? And again, since Pence was trying to target black men, to me, that was a moment to also say, and you're the folks who refuse to even allow police consent decrees. You're the ones who are letting cops get off scot-free. You don't want to hold them accountable. And, and, and that's the piece. The reality is you have Trump, Pence, Republicans, who want to wrap themselves around cops. That's why all these police unions endorse them. That's why they support them, because these cops in this country do not want to be held accountable by anyone. Greg, you're on mute. Greg, on mute. Uh, Greg, you're muted at home. You're live here. All right, so uh, we're going to do this here. We're going to uh, so here's what so so, so here's what I'm going to do, folks. Uh, we're going to uh, get Greg's uh, audio fixed. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to play you. Uh, this was Senator Kamala Harris and Joe Biden kicking off their bus tour in Arizona. Uh, this took place about 30 minutes ago. Where's 
Vanessa. How are you? Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you so very much for that introduction and for your leadership and all you do for the community here in Phoenix. Thank you. Um, it's good to see everybody. It's good to be in the House of Labor. Um, earlier today, Joe and I had a chance to visit the American Indian Veterans National Memorial and pay tribute to the Native Americans who have served our country in uniform. We were joined by the great Cindy McCain, a longtime friend of Joe's and someone I greatly admire. And I was fortunate to serve with John McCain in the United States Senate. And what an incredible, incredible American. Um, he was a patriot of the highest order. And Cindy is supporting our campaign. Uh, isn't that great? And she's doing it because she knows that Joe and I will always do what she and John did. And that's put our country first. So we thank Cindy. We are so excited to be here in Arizona today. And later today, we'll stop and talk with workers and small business owners who are working so hard and doing everything right, but still struggling to get by. They are who I was thinking about last night at the debate. This election, more than any other in our lifetime, will affect every part of our lives with consequences that may last generations. And there is so much at stake. Our nation is at a crossroads. Just think, all at the same time, we are experiencing the pandemic, the recession, a reckoning on racial justice, a changing climate that's battering our coastlines and setting the West on fire, and the future of healthcare hangs on top of it all. Because you see, President Trump is in the Supreme Court right now trying to get rid of the Affordable Care Act. And along with Senate Republicans, he's trying to jam through a Supreme Court justice who will do exactly that, who will rip away protections from as many as 2.8 million Arizonans with pre-existing conditions. 2.8. Arizonans with pre-existing conditions. And while this president, of course, didn't bring the virus to our shores, his reckless disregard for human life and for the well-being of the American people has allowed it to spread the way we have seen. And the casualties have been enormous. And so let's not make any mistake, his refusal to contain this virus is what has wreaked havoc on our economy. And I know folks are hurting, but I also know this. We can overcome these challenges if we elect Joe Biden as our next president. <laughs> and here's the thing. Joe has had a plan for COVID at least since March. He's been talking about this. He knows what this means and the kind of leadership that is required to get, in, get on top of it and get in control. Joe knows these things. Even, and you guys may have seen the debate last night, even when Joe didn't have the briefing that Donald Trump and Mike Pence had on January 28th, Joe knew because of experience that this could be serious. And under his leadership, we will contain this virus and save lives and build our economy back better than before. Joe will be a president who restores the soul of our nation. He'll be a president who creates good paying jobs and eases the burden on working families. And above all, Joe will be a president who unites the American people. Democrats and Republicans and independents, old and young from all backgrounds and races, to meet the greatest challenges of our time. And I plan on being right by his side. And, <laughs> and we'll be ready on day one. We'll be ready on day one. 
But here's the thing, Arizona. We need your help. We've got only 26 days left. So let's not wake up the day after the election on November 4th wishing we'd done more. Let's organize and vote in numbers no one has ever seen before. Let's send Mark Kelly to the Senate. <laughs> vote like your life depends on it. Because right now, it really does. And yesterday, Arizona, vote by mail ballots were shipped to homes across this state. And in-person early voting has started, including at the new McDowell Square Voting Center, just about a mile from here. So be a first week voter, a first week voter. And there are four ways to vote in Arizona. You can vote by mail. All right, folks, we're gonna dip out of that. I'll bring back my panel here, uh, Erica, Reese, and Greg. Uh, where this race stands right now, first of all, they, they're, that's the first time they've, the two of them have campaigned together uh, since mm -hmm. they announced that she was the VP nominee. Uh, one of the things that we are seeing how this race has changed, the fact that they're actually kicking off this bus tour after the debates in Arizona. Uh, that state is in play. Polls show that uh, Joe Biden is leading in Arizona. Maricopa County is the largest county in Arizona. Uh, he's leading there. This has been a red state. Mark Kelly, a uh, former NASA, a former astronaut, uh, he of course uh, is uh, he of course uh, is running for the United States Senate. Has a 10 to 12 point lead against uh, Martha McSally. What we are seeing here in terms of uh, this race, Greg, we're seeing how. The map is changing. Trump is flailing. Uh, he put out this video today looking like a fool, looking like he burnt orange. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we're talking about Regeneron and how, how, how great he feels and how on Fox News, I would have I would love to do a rally. I feel so healthy. Dude, stop lying. You still got it. And we know you got it. Uh, it's people. I mean, it's more than 20 people in the White House who've gotten coronavirus. I mean, he is a walking, talking example of sheer stupidity. Mm -hmm. Rolling again, I mean, brother, your humanity continues to shine through. Yes, he's stupid, but they don't care. Nope. Smell my piss showed mm. that last night. I mean, they're purebred liars. I mean, the fact that Regeneron and uh, Remdesivir were both developed by testing them from cells from fetal tissue, yes. which is the exact mm -hmm. opposite of what Smiling Mike Pence believes in his little bitty heart of heart and what Donald Trump will believe to anything to get elected. It, it, I mean, these are the kind of things that in a world where logic and fact and truth make sense, you could slam them on. And so, you know, even sitting there, even watching them today, you, you think about the fact that yesterday Derek Chauvin was released on $100,000 bail, the killer of George Floyd. What does his GoFundMe account looks like? And then this toad bar authorizes one of the deputies uh, in the, at the uh, attorney general's office to say they can look into investigations and, and open investigations on potential voter fraud this close to election, violating decades of policy. They are, they have thrown all notions of truth to right. the wind. They are going after the throats of everyone. But for Donald Trump to get on, uh, to tweet out today that Joe Biden should be locked up and Obama should be locked up, for him to call Kamala Harris, Senator Harris, a monster, you know what? See, these are the kind of cats you just got to knock the fuck out. You can't. You can't you, I mean, you can't. You. I mean, again, kudos to Senator Harris last night because I, I, maybe I'm projecting, but I could feel, because we've seen her differently. We've seen her, as you say, in terror. We've seen her destroy Bill Barr. But 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 as Reese said, your job is to pump up Joe Biden. So whatever these minders, whatever these Democratic Party operatives are doing, right. if they're going, you know, if you got Joe Biden sitting behind you with his arms folded like this, no, nah, bro, put your hands down between your legs and sit there and listen to the sister. Everything is in play now, and this is about political theater. Your opponents mm -hmm. understand that. Damn the truth. They are going for the right. jugular. You have to right. just you have to destroy them down to their DNA. And right. then the day they win, the day Harris and Biden win, I'm like what Linda Sarcer said on your show. We've got our best opponents in the White House. There should be a march bigger than the women's march was. And Tamika and everybody else, we should all be out there, Mallory and all of them. Why? Because Biden Harris 
Now it's time for us to give all the political momentum for y'all to get there and not just reverse what these fools have done. Right. Now it's time to build the country that will be the only thing that can last. And That's under, what we have to do now. And, and understand yeah. what is going on. It's a perfect example of what Donald Trump has unleashed in today in Michigan. 13 men, including members of the anti-government militia Wolverine Watchmen, are facing charges for allegedly conspiring to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer and possibly killed her. They were going to kidnap her from her summer vacation home and storm the state capitol building with 200 men. Now, folks, the plot was revealed in an FBI criminal complaint which named six people as federal defendants from Michigan, Delaware, and Ohio. These white domestic terrorists, Adam Fox, mm -hmm. Barry Croft, uh, Ga Caleb Garwin, uh, Daniel Franks, uh, Harrison, Brandon, and uh, Harrison, Brandon Caserta. Uh, again, Adam Fox, Barry Croft, Garvin, Caleb Franks, Daniel Harris, Brandon Caserta. Now, Attorney General Dana Nessel of Michigan announced state terrorism charges against an additional seven individuals, all tied to Wolverine Watchmen. The complaint reads, in early 2020, the FBI became aware through social media that a group of individuals were discussing the violent overthrow of certain government and law enforcement components. Among those individuals identified were Croft and Fox. Through, uh, through electronic communications, uh, Croft and Fox agreed to unite others to end their cause and take violent action against multiple state governments that they believe are violating the U.S. Constitution. The complaint goes on to detail where they met, what they discussed, and how they communicated. Governor Whitmer said this today after the charges were announced. Good afternoon. Earlier today, Attorney General Dana Nessel was joined by officials from the Department of Justice and the FBI to announce state and federal charges against 13 members of two militia groups who were preparing to kidnap and possibly kill me. When I put my hand on the Bible and took the oath of office 22 months ago, I knew this job would be hard. But I'll be honest, I never could have imagined anything like this. I want to start by saying thank you to our law enforcement. Thank you to the fearless FBI agents. And thank you to the brave Michigan State Police Troopers who participated in this operation, acting under the leadership of Colonel Joe Gasper. I also want to thank Attorney General Nessel and the U.S. Attorneys Burge and Schneider and their teams for pursuing criminal charges that hopefully will lead to convictions, bringing these sick and depraved men to justice. As a mom with two teenage daughters and three stepsons, my husband and I are eternally grateful to everyone who put themselves in harm's way to keep our family safe. This should be a moment for national unity, where we all pull together as Americans to meet this challenge head on with the same might and muscle that put a man on the moon. Seeing the humanity in one another and doing our part to help our country get through this. Instead, our head of state has spent the past seven months denying science, ignoring his own health experts, stoking distrust, fomenting anger, and giving comfort to those who spread fear and hatred and division. Just last week, the President of the United States stood before the American people and refused to condemn white supremacists and hate groups like these two Michigan militia groups. Stand back and stand by, he told them. Stand back and stand by. Hate groups heard the President's words not as a rebuke, but as a rallying cry as a call to action. When our leaders speak, their words matter. They carry weight. When our leaders meet with, encourage, or fraternize with domestic terrorists, they legitimize their actions, and they are complicit. When they stoke and contribute to hate speech, they are complicit. These domestic terrorists have been emboldened by the White House, folks, uh, since John Trump was in there. Joining me now is Malcolm Nance, the author of a number of books, including The Plot to Betray America, 
how Team Trump embraced our enemies. Guys, show the book, please. How Team Trump embraced our enemies, compromised our security, and how we can fix it. That's his book right there. Malcolm, uh, look, the FBI director, Christopher Wray, has said before Congress numerous times, the biggest threat of white domestic terrorists. Joe Biden emphasized that at last week's debate. Donald Trump was spewing nonsense, talking about Antifa, blasting him, and all these Republicans... Let's just be honest, they are in bed with these white militias. Well, if we're specifically talking about white militias, yes, they are the hardcore base of Donald Trump's support. Uh, this is why he will not uh, disassociate himself from the Proud Boys or the Ku Klux Klan or anybody else who is Caucasian and supports Donald Trump and flies a Trump flag, whether, you know, there's all sorts of violent groups there and people who are semi-violent. We had uh, a massacre at a Jewish synagogue in Pittsburgh. Trump supporter. We had a man who mailed bombs in, in an attempt, a crude attempt to decapitate the entire Democratic Party. Trump supporter. We had armed gunmen that went to a, uh, went to a synagogue in San Diego. Right-wing extremists, white supremacists, Trump supporters. I mean, these people are his base and he thoroughly understands it he cannot lose white men, so he doesn't care who supports him or what they do. And and, and the thing here is that the Rep and, and I, I was driving in. And I said this here: anybody that votes for Donald Trump should pay the heaviest political price for what they're doing to this country. Because here's the reality, Malcolm: Trump is going to lose. He's going to get beat badly, and these people at least 25 or 30% of this country, they will never accept the results. They have emboldened them. This is not the Tea Party. This is even going, even, even going even crazier. And these folks are going to continue to threaten storming capitals. These are the anti-mask people. Trust me, when there's a vaccine, they're going to be anti-vaccine people. Uh, they're going to be pushing their conspiracy theories. And you're going to have idiots like Jim Jordan and Louis Gomer and, uh, uh, and others, the crazy, crazy woman out of Georgia who's guaranteed to win, uh, Marjorie Greene. They are going to be their uh, uh, flag bearers in the Congress. Right. And, you know, we really have to have a, 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 some preparation for what could possibly happen. Look, I know that we are trying to maintain the norms that we have, and that's great. But this plot against Governor Whitmer is serious. It is very, very serious. If I were to take the name uh, Wolverine's militia off of this story and slap ISIS or Al-Qaeda in it, it would be 24-7 coverage. I would never leave the studio, much less be in my, my, uh, my man cave in my home. Be real clear. If this was 20 Black Lives Matter activists, um, oh, oh, my well, Lord. There'd be a national push to arrest everyone in every major city in America who had anything to do with the leadership of Black Lives Matter. This is where we have this double standard. Long ago, when I first started, I wrote a book that's used by almost all federal law enforcement officers called the Terrorist Recognition Handbook. And we have sections in there about white nationalist extremists. This isn't new. Timothy McVeigh, when he blew up the Murrah building in Oklahoma City, thought he was launching a race war in which every cop and soldier in America was supposed to recognize the attack as the moment they take their guns and kill every black in government. That's what he thought would happen. These people really believed, according to the indictment, that there were law enforcement members associated with the militia. And like McVeigh, you know, I met the cop that pulled Timothy McVeigh over and arrested him because the cop knew instantly that he had the right guy. But Mc, he said McVeigh thought he was his ally in blowing up that building. And he was proud to show him his gun. This is the mindset these militias have. They think the government, the military, state troopers and law enforcement are on their side. And the only reason the FBI got an informant out of the box was because they intended to kill, not only kidnap and kill, not only the governor, they intended to kill her sixth man state trooper security detail. They were going to blow up the bridge where there would be two or four more policemen there. And then they were planning on running and gunning 
um, and taking the governor up to Wisconsin, of all places, in order to put her on trial as a tyrant and execute her. And why? Because she insisted they wear face masks in Michigan. This is insane. But the insanity has weapons. And the insanity believes they have the, the open in, endorsement of the president of the United States. Uh, but it's not just they have weapons. Uh, they also, uh, and ProPublica, and I'm trying to find the story uh, right now, ProPublica uh, did a particular story laying out how the how these militias, in terms of they're targeting cops. Not only that, uh, we know the FBI dropped their own report that showed how police officers and white supremacists, first of all, how, how, how militia members and white supremacists are infiltrating police departments. That's why Timothy McVeigh was thinking that way. And that's why when black folks are talking about uh, racist cops, we know what the hell we're talking about. Well, you're, you're right. They do recruit from those areas. And, that, you know, I wouldn't call it infiltration. I've trained a lot of law enforcement in, in New York, Georgia, all over the country, uh, all of these SWAT teams and, and organizations that carry out counterterrorism. One of, one of the interesting things I learned is that 80 percent of them do not go in the military. They all go to cop school after high school, right? They go to these police academies and they have no fundamental training in the discipline of the armed force. So many of them get these exact same ideas, particularly sheriffs, because the posse comitatus movement in the United States uh, and the sovereign citizen movement have created this myth that the sheriff is the only authorized law enforcement that they answer to. That permeates into the mindset of these anti-government extremists and anyone who's a deputy sheriff or a cop or a retired cop or a retired soldier that comes into these ridiculous little, um, I don't call them militias, I call them covert terrorist cells, right? They're domestic terrorist cells who are in insurgency training inside the United States. The only difference is I use the word American versus Iraqi or, or Syrian, right? So these domestic terrorist cells, when they get a single guy who comes in there who's been in the army or a guy that comes in from law enforcement, they co-opt that belief that they these people are all on their side. One thing I can tell you, um, I, having trained as a SWAT officer at one point with, with Capitol Hill Police and Los Angeles Police SWAT, cops are a very jealous organization. They love the concept that they are the arbiters of law and order. So if these groups think that they're going to go to guns and step up the cops, this is the one time you will see police defend the system because they do not like anything other than the fact that they are the system. They don't like people with guns going on shooting sprees wherever they are. So they'll defend the governor. They'll defend the people of Michigan, you know, for all the faults that we see inside the system. And this is a, this is a mistake these crazy terrorist cells are making because we are not designed to collapse in a world like you know, The Walking Dead, where you think you can just get away with everything because you have guns. Uh, well, look, uh, this is something that is going to have major implications moving forward. Uh, I, have, I have been saying since 2009, folks, get prepared for white fear, white minority resistance. These people are going to be very much involved in that. Malcolm Nance, author of the book, The Plot to Destroy Democracy. We certainly appreciate you joining us at Roller Martin Unfiltered. Thanks a lot. My pleasure. Uh, let's go, let's go uh, back to our panel. Uh, Erica, again, this is, this is something that, th this is not an anomaly. This is going to happen a lot mm. more. Yeah, absolutely. And the reporting bears it out. We just seen the New York Times reported uh, earlier this week where there was a suppressed uh, threat assessment that um, comes out annually that, in fact, talks about white supremacy and that these groups as being really the <laughs> most prominent threat to our society right now um, on American soil, that it is, in fact, white domestic terrorists. And so just thinking about that, the implications of you have a William Barr, who, as Dr. Carr says, is, in fact, the toady um, of the son of a Klansman, when you think that he is has weaponized the Department of Justice uh, for his own uh, kind of uh, happenings, when we look at that and we think about this report that was suppressed, 
that did in fact talk about the violence. I'm just considering and thinking about, well, you know, as a person who has a military background, it was good to see Malcolm on. But one of the things that I would love to ask him is when we think about those folks that have gone and they have uh, been in war and served abroad doing many conflicts, fighting terrorism, would you consider a Donald John Trump to be a person that is radicalizing these people that we're seeing here on American soil? So I think that uh, in addition to these are threats that we're going to continue to see, to also understand, if I've uh, said before earlier, that you know even after an election, uh, prayerfully it'll be in favor of Biden and Harris, that there is much work to be done. It is not time to be complacent. It is not time to just say, well, I voted and they won. I've done my job. It is really time to be prepared for really the hard and heavy work that is going to be state, local, and federal uh, government cleanup and really just protections around these people who have, um, have a commander in Donald John Trump that still feel that they have been called uh, to order. Um, and will obey him no matter, you know, where he may find himself post the election. This is what I've been saying, Reese. Uh, the, the, what Donald Trump has unleashed, what Republicans mm -hmm. have supported, when these fools in Congress, uh, by them shaming and blasting others for wearing masks, these are the people who stormed the state capitol in Idaho, in Michigan, in Wisconsin, and that's what you're seeing. You're going to see more of that because these deranged individuals think that they are true patriots and they are, have no problem. They are racist against black people. The Proud Boys are racist as well. I don't care if some dude out there is, who's Latino, who's hitting the Proud Boys, there are Latinos who are racist. Uh, and so folk had better understand these folks are not going away and the Republican Party, knowing full well how their base is shrinking and shrinking, they're going to be even more appealing to these bigots and these thugs, these white domestic terrorists. Absolutely. We have uh, currently COVID infected Senator Mike Lee, who said today on Twitter mm. that democracy is not the objective and actually that ranked right. democracy is a threat to liberty and things of that nature. That is a call to these militias. I call them terrorists. Be and I and I what I what I'm really sick of is the fact that if this was a group of Muslims or if it was as you said Black Lives Matter, these would be called terrorists. This would be called a terrorist cell. But instead, because they're white, they're called militias, and it almost indicates some sort of patriotism when in fact it is sedition. The same kind of sedition that Donald, I mean that William Barr wants to charge Black Lives Matter protesters with, where are the sedition charges for these people who are trying to overthrow government? Where is the law and order party when it comes to these terrorists who are trying to attack and murder, kidnap government officials? Where is the law and order when it comes to that? But as we point out many times on this show, when it comes to Republicans, their law and order is not about law and order in terms of the laws as written in the Constitution, because whenever they don't care about that, it is about the order of white supremacy. And so that's why we do not see them condemning or discouraging this. We actually see them encouraging it and radicalizing it. Stand back and stand by is a hold tight until we need to call upon you. But these people are trying to stockpile things. The way that they got these people on these charges was when they were trying to exchange the money for the explosives and the ammunitions and things like that. And so this is something to absolutely be very, very wary of. More black people have to have guns. I'm not saying we start a race war. Be clear about that. I'm not advocating violence. But we have to be prepared to defend ourselves. Make sure you get licensed guns. Make sure that you have all your paperwork in order. But go on ahead and, 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 and make sure that you're not caught out there because, I mean, I personally don't think that these people are very much in our neighborhoods. These are in mostly white areas that these people did get radicalized in. But just in case, it don't hurt to have some kind of something sold away in case shit goes down. Greg. No, Reese's right. I mean, Roland, since this criminal enterprise began, this settler colony called, we call the United States now, it's been, been 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 building toward this. I don't know if anybody could have predicted that there would be one event that might be the event horizon to forestall the inevitable. But when you're talking about a white nationalist settler colony project, settler colonialism, this is inevitable. And, you know, Malcolm mentioned uh, Timothy McVeigh. 
a military veteran, Desert Storm, mm -hmm. who came. And, then we, and when you listen to his testimony, this man who blew up the Oklahoma federal building and killed a little bu bunch of black babies who were in that daycare yep. that day, in case people don't mm -hmm. remember, uh, he saw himself as a patriot, and he was. Mm -hmm. And by patriot, I mean not what we be talking about, patriotism. No, no, I'm talking about what patriot really means in a settler colony. It means a white nationalist. So when we saw these people, you know, everywhere but the United States, ISIS is referred to as Daesh. That's what it's called in the Muslim world and, you know, coverage. Of, but here in the United States, it's called ISIS. Fine. What we saw in Michigan with what some people are calling vanilla ISIS is the <laughs> one wing of the white nationalist project. They're all working together. Understand mm -hmm. another wing is the Michigan State Supreme Court that ruled last mm -hmm. week, 43, that the governor of the state doesn't have the power to extend uh, the emergency measures that prevented mm -hmm. perhaps as many as 74,000 deaths with COVID-19. Another wing is Neil Gorsuch and them on a Supreme Court who want to revive that same doctrine in the federal level, what they call uh, the non-delegation doctrine. So when Vanilla ISIS was meeting to hatch this plot, they weren't meeting in Michigan. They met in Dublin, Ohio. I went to grad school and law school at, at Ohio State in Columbus. Dublin is the Columbus suburb. So another element of the White Nationalist Party is the Secretary of State, uh, Frank La Rosa, who's another member of Vanilla ISIS. He just happens to be an elected member. So when he mm -hmm. lost his case a couple of days ago, when the Ohio Supreme Court says, no, you can put more than one uh, ballot box out, he says, fine, but they all got to be at a single location. So I'll put a bunch of them around the one polling, uh, the, one, the, 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 the office in each county. Understand they're all working together. Greg Abbott, the governor of your home state, Texas, is a member of the White Nationalist Terrorist Party, mm -hmm. except he's an elected member. So when he says mm -hmm. put one box per county, he's working hand in hand. And all vanilla ISIS is, like all Timothy McVeigh thought he was, they are the paramilitary wing. Finally, Jamie Raskin had the most important event that took place last week. Uh, it wasn't the debate or, or, or the screaming match. That not not screaming, Matt. Donald Trump screaming at Joe Biden. That same day is when you were talking to Malcolm, and you you mentioned it, Roland. It was the hearing that Jamie Raskin, Congressman Raskin, held on Capitol Hill, with the Subcommittee on Civil Rights and Liberties, about the fact mm -hmm. that these paramilitary folks have invaded law enforcement, mm -hmm. and he used the 2006 FBI report, and mm -hmm. this FBI decided that well, they're not going to testify, they're not going to come. Why? law enforcement is riddled with white supremacists. Yep. When the Vietnam yes. War was over, some of them got on a plane and fought in what used to be Rhodesia on the side against the Africans in Zimbabwe. And then Dylan Ralph, when he was arrested, you know why he had a South Africa, old South Africa patch on his arm when he went in there and shot up these people at, uh, at, at the church, at, in uh, Emmanuel Church in South Carolina? Because he saw himself as law enforcement. Law enforcement, the white nationalist party that is silent about this, and Vanilla ISIS are all part of the same thrust. They are going to run white supremacy till the wheels run off. And if we don't understand that, everything else we think we understand, to quote Neely Fuller and Francis Cress Wilson, will only confuse us. You've got to go to a break. Amen. When we come back, we'll talk about Rihanna Taylor Amen. case. We'll talk some other news right here on Roller Martin Unfiltered. You want to check out Roller Martin Unfiltered? YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roland Martin Unfiltered. See that name right there? Roland Martin Unfiltered. Like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And don't forget to turn on your notifications so when we go live, you'll know it. And I think people don't understand how important that is because they think that the vote is right now. Oh no, this this uh, this appointment to this to the Supreme Court, that's a big thing. That's gonna that's a ripple effect forever. The files related to the internal investigation of the fatal shooting of Breonna Taylor have been released. The investigation was done by the Louisville Police Department's Public Integrity Unit. Investigative file contains interview transcripts, investigative letters, reports, police personnel files, search warrants, and other information. Body camera video from the officers who were on the scene is also included. 
The release of these investigative files comes nearly a week after the grand jury recordings were released. Joining me now is Samil Trevetti, senior staff attorney for the Criminal Law Reform Project with the ACLU. Samil, first and foremost, uh, what are we learning from these uh, files? And also, what are we learning from the grand jury uh, reports that were also released? Thanks for having me, Roland. Uh, we're learning that there is a cover-up at play here. Uh, it's pretty clear that the reason that the Kentucky AG sent this to the grand jury in the first place is that he could control and um, and tweak the investigation to his liking, um, which is made perfectly clear by the fact that even though a judge ordered him to release the grand jury tapes, he's still withholding his own recommendations, which we now know don't include murder charges. So this is um, a more systemic problem that is coming to a head in Louisville, where we see that prosecutors are controlling the system to benefit cops. And so, uh, you know, again, looking at this, you've got Kentucky Attorney General uh, Cameron. Uh, he, he's been in his feelings. He was a little he's upset because Megan Thee Stallion uh, put him on blast on Saturday Night Live. But the reality is he lied. He lied when at his news conference and then wouldn't answer certain questions uh, when he was asked about the case. But he lied. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, and now he's been caught. And not only did he with withhold the grand jury tapes in the first place. Now he's fighting a grand jury, uh, grand juror's motion uh, to to speak publicly about what happened uh, behind closed doors. Um, and uh, it's painfully obvious to everybody here that he is engaged in a cover up for cops who they have an, an inextricable conflict of interest. And until we deal with that, um, until we understand that prosecutors are continually uh, covering for their friends, the police, we are not going to get an even-handed system of justice in the United States. Um, when it comes to, uh, so so they release this, okay, then fine. What's next? What happens? Well, uh, what we need is a, a further independent investigation. If we had a functioning civil rights division at the U.S. at the United States Department of Justice, for example, we would bring that in. Um, we, we're still not precluded from bringing more charges against the folks uh, who were involved, against the police officers who were involved. And beyond that, we need systemic change. You know, Attorney General uh, Cameron uh, was really fond of saying during his uh, press conference that, you know, we need to move on. We need to take the next step. Uh, but he has all the ability in the world to move on and make systemic changes uh, and to open up more investigations and be more transparent with the people of Kentucky. But it's clear he doesn't want to do that. He wants to bury this case and move forward. Uh, well, that is uh, certainly the case. Samil Trevetti with the ACLU, we certainly appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Roland. All right, folks. Uh, we've often shown you a number of anti-Trump ads, but do you realize that they are not necessarily getting the attention they should be getting on social media. We're going to air some of these, and I'm going to explain to you why after they run. Check this out. Donald Trump will never change. Over 200,000 Americans dead. Trump said COVID-19 affects almost nobody. But then he got it. His wife got it. His press secretary got it. His debate team got it. His White House staff got it. Trump turned the White House into a hot zone. Now Trump is still trying to convince us that the greatest public health threat in over a century isn't a big deal, while he gasps for air fresh from the hospital. Americans know there's a lot more wrong with Donald Trump than just having COVID-19. He doesn't care about others, can't lead, can't plan, can't face the truth. Donald Trump will never change. He's killing us. This year, vote like your life depends on it. The Lincoln Project is responsible for the content of this advertising. Why has the White House blocked the CDC from contact tracing this super spreader event? Maybe it's because the White House already knows who is patient zero. Why won't you wear a mask? Is it because the president would be disappointed in you if you don't wear a mask? I feel that it's safe for me not to be wearing a mask, and I'm in compliance with CDC guidelines, which are recommended but not required. Talk about your contacts with the president, what precautions you took. Oh, no one's wearing masks in the room. 
um, when we were prepping the president during that period of time. It is being contained. And do you not think it's being contained? Late today, we learned that Stephen Miller, senior advisor to the president, has also tested positive. Yeah, you spent a lot of time at the White House. Do you think there's a hole in the system there now? I don't. As the CDC continue to study the spread of COVID-19, they're recommending that people wear cloth face coverings in public settings where social distancing measures can be difficult to maintain. President Trump just tweeted moments ago that he and the First Lady have tested positive for the coronavirus. I know there's a risk, there's a danger, but that's okay. And now I'm better and maybe I'm immune, I don't know. They are lying to you every day. If Donald Trump can't protect himself or his staff, how can he possibly protect America? First of all, how in the hell are you immune when you got it? Now, uh, here's the deal. Uh, filmmakers uh, of these uh, various ads say that they're being throttled on platforms like Twitter. So, so here's, here's what Republicans do. So you have these, these army of Trump supporters. So what they do is when one of those videos runs, it typically gets about 5 million views on Twitter. They then file a claim against the video, and then what Twitter does is they simply essentially block the video. And so what they noticed was, folks like 11 Films and others, they noticed that all of a sudden their videos that should have been getting more than 5 million views all of a sudden were getting 750,000 and topping out at a million. Is this digital suppression? Shireen Mitchell, she tracks these things. She joins us right now. Shireen, uh, this is something that, again, average person's like, I, I don't see what the big deal is, but what what we, we experienced this last week, and, I, and, and was it, I can't remember, was it after the debate, Shireen, where we begin to post different things and on Instagram, you would get this notice by saying, this looks like a material that's been blocked uh, by others, do you sure you want to post it? So what they're doing is they are attacking posts, and if they attack enough, it then triggers the algorithms to then block similar stuff, correct? Correct. Correct. And, and just be clear that this is a tactic that was done because what they used to do was that if they saw content or saw people who they didn't agree with, they would just basically have a pylon, basically having all the fake accounts and troll accounts come after that that person and that and their account and and try to either shut their shut them down from from the attacks, i.e., because they were overwhelmed, or try to delude you know whatever the content was and make it look like that they were the major voice that's being heard over the real content that was present. So because that tactic is no longer working, why? because now you can see the attacks and those attacks are now being documented. And so their accounts are being shut, shut down. So instead of dealing with it from that perspective, a good example is what we will talk about what happened in 2016. Some, some, of these, some of these activities is because of exactly what Twitter did in 2016, where they basically waited to after the election to shut down certain, certain accounts that were violating their terms of server, service. That includes the Milos of the world, right? It was after the election that they did this. Well, before that, other people were under attack and being targeted, and those people were being targeted without being protected. And some of them got their accounts shut down or banned because of those attacks, instead of the people like Milo. So they waited to after the election so they didn't look like they were being biased to shut those accounts down. Now, as a result, that angered certain groups, and this group that you're talking about this, that's doing this other model of it, where they're now coming back to those accounts. They're not attacking them outright. What they're doing is they're submitting them as if that they are harmful or violent content. And that is what's triggering these algorithms when actually none of these are any of that in any form. But the other thing that they're trying to do, because there is a new uh, trigger in, in both the platforms, Twitter and Facebook, that basically say if this is disinformation, you can actually, or, 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 or this is something that is uh, impacting the election, or this is about election in integrity, they're triggering that part of, in my opinion, and what we're seeing right now, that part of the algorithm that is new, because they just put that particular, um, put, put that particular uh, uh, aspect in place. 
And so people don't realize that as they're trying to say that, for example, when Trump had his account taken down or his tweet taken down because he was lying about COVID after he, quote unquote, came out, i.e. immune, which was not true, um, that was finally taken down and not given a disclaimer. What, what everyone else was getting was disclaimers to say some of this content is not true, is possibly not true, which is what's happening to these groups. And that's slowing it down. What they, were, what they weren't doing to Trump before was taking his content down. So now his content got removed because the COVID information was completely false. And now these groups are angry about that and trying to target Biden's teams, or those who are, who, are, who are promoting Biden in any way, who are having any conversation about what they think uh, should be said of trying to get out the vote um, and targeting them as if, it's, as, this is, as if this is an equal debate. And it's not. And, and I'll give you just, again, so people have to understand uh, how these how the algorithms are really controlling everything these days. Uh, Shireen is a perfect example. Um, we, um, um, we have been battling Facebook for quite some time uh, because uh, we noticed that we were not able for some reason to monetize uh, our show on Facebook. Go to my iPad. So here's a, one of the things that we got from them. Um, not eligible... Uh, to monetize, but 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 but, but, but then when we begin to check it out, so check this out. This is what they hit us with: limited originality of content. Roland Martin shared content <laughs> that was unoriginal or repurposed content from other sources with limited added value. Now, what's interesting is that this whole show is original. Now, we do share clips and things along those lines, like every other news show. And so we have been battling Facebook. And I mean, I literally sent an email and said last night, why the hell am I even, I said, if I can't make money off the platform, I don't need to be on it. But what's happening is, again, these algorithms are, are, are bouncing folks out. And what ends up happening is you're unable to have your video seen, to monetize these videos. So you're sort of like in this dark hole. And then, yeah, you have no idea what the hell caused it, what the hell triggered it. But what's happening here, these are specific attacks by conservatives targeting any anti-Trump people because they want to make sure the videos do not go viral. Absolutely. And, and, be, and be clear, remember, I'm on the, you know, the Facebook oversight board. We're, we're still working on issues that Facebook is not addressing pro properly. So we've gotten a couple of successes so far because we're, we're basically saying, here are the things you haven't done right, and we, I guess you need public pressure to do it the right way. And so absolutely, not only is the content like yours is being shut down, but any content, of in it, which I tell people all the time, those that are pushing out issues that are important to them, whether it's about immigration. Like, if immigration is classified as a political ad. If you're talking about that saying, hey, we want to help this community, if it's a nonprofit, it's classified as a political ad instead of a nonprofit. While, while politicians get to sh share their ads with lies in them, <laughs> targeting those same immigrants as if this is an equal playing field, and it's not. There's a power dynamic that's going on here, but the other part of this is the algorithm part that, that, that takes part in this. So unless the algorithm kicks it for a human to, to look at it, and, and again, you know, Zuckerberg has basically blamed his content moderators <laughs> for, for not moderating the content properly when that does happen, but that the algorithms themselves can be gamed in such a way that you can have um, certain content like, like yours to be removed. And so in this moment, the reason why this is so important was that in 2016, we know for a fact that, they, that, the, the, that the political ads, uh, the ad system in Facebook, as well as Twitter were gamed in 2016 with fake accounts, with, um, with, false, um, with, with false content. And so they think they're fixing this by, by coming up with these solutions that are, in my opinion, you know, basically have ass. I mean, I'm sorry to say that. But, what, what, but they're, they're trying to come up with a solution where they're not coming at the base problem. And part of their base problem is the algorithm. They, they've said before, they have the algorithm to take hate speech off and remove all hate speech, but they're not putting that algorithm in, in place. Why not? If there's hate speech on the platform, remove it. There should be no question about that. But what they've said is because it might be a politician spreading hate speech, that's the reason why they're not using the algorithm. And you're just going... So it's acceptable for hate speech under certain conditions, and i.e. if you happen to be a politician, right? But not me. I can't, I can't, I can't speak in any form of hate speech. But 
but a politician can't, and that's acceptable. And they can actually place the ad in that way, and you won't do anything about that. And that's why they need to be held accountable for not only their ads, but the decisions that they make uh, in terms of their terms of service. We're just asking them to, to actually use their terms of service. They have created their own terms of service. Use them as they're supposed to be used so that we don't go through issues like this where someone feels like they are being disenfranchised when they were breaking the rules in the first place and should not have been able to do the things that they were doing. Instead of telling people who are not breaking the rules that somehow they are part of the same um, process when they're not. Putting out these ads, as long as it doesn't violate, uh, it, it doesn't have violence in it, it doesn't have disin disinformation in it. It doesn't have um, it doesn't have um, content that is uh, again what pornography or, or or intimate images in it. These are not the types of things that should be should have disclaimers. Again, uh, this is uh, the war that we've seen being waged on the digital side. Shereen Mitchell, we appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you for having me again. Uh, this is the, this is the reality, Reese. I think people need to understand the battles that are being waged. And that is, mm -hmm. uh, in, in the piece that we read, Democrats are having to play catch up. They, frankly, were behind. Republicans, look, Republicans have always been excellent at voter suppression tactics. Now, in right. this case, they are really focusing on using these skills because they see what is happening on the digital side and how they can be stop things from going on. And Democrats are playing catch up in this digital war. Absolutely. I think, I mean, to some degree, the internet is a place of somewhat of an equalizer, but it's not the great equalizer that it once was because of the algorithms. I've been saying it, people probably thought I was just crazy or making excuses, but the bottom line is that these algorithms make all of the difference in terms of how our social medias are curated, how we are seeing which accounts, how often we're seeing them and the content. And as you point out, you might not even know that your stuff is being uh, filtered out or things of that nature. And absolutely, people are abusing these reporting systems and it's it's having an impact. And this is why we see things like, I, I made a video earlier about this um, sex trafficking QAnon conspiracy that seems to be permeating Black social media, particular Facebook and Instagram, where people are starting to say outlandish things like if you are against, if you're voting against Trump, you're voting for pedophilia and for sex traffickers. It's because all of the, the, the Republicans are winning. These crazies, these QAnon people are winning, aside from being banned on Facebook now all of a sudden, are winning the social media manipulation algorithm game. It's about bots. It's about programming and we rely a lot on organic content but it can only be so organic it can only be so viral when you have these algorithms in place so what people have to understand is don't think that you're seeing everything out there don't think because you're not seeing something that means it doesn't exist that just means that the way that you hit like and retweet and comment is further filtering down what you see if you want to get information you have to be more proactive about seeking that information out when you are seeing things that right. you like you have to interact with those things. I tell you, that's one thing I encourage Kamala supporters is interact with tweets that are pro Kamala, interact with 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 things so that you see more of it, so that those right. things get higher visibility, so that they get treated higher in algorithms. It's so it's all a game that we haven't figured out yet on and, our side. And Greg, when you start to, again, when you start looking at on YouTube, when you look at on all, all of these different platforms. Uh, there are people who gain the system. Uh, Facebook kicked, mm -hmm. kicked off folks like Epoch Times and others because they realized what they were doing is they were actually filtering the same information to 10 and 20 different websites. Uh, and all, that's, that's how conservatives have been playing this game. And then what conservatives do, Greg, is they go, oh, my God, they're targeting us. I mean, they're very mm -hmm. excellent at whining. Uh, and, and, so, and then with the companies like, oh, my goodness, we don't want to get criticized by the conservatives. Then talk radio and Fox News and Trump is going to tweet about us. So they bend over backwards uh, to not offend them and that's what you see happen and that's what we continue to see happen they want to win the digital war because it's easier to spread in disinformation uh mm -hmm. it moves six times faster than truth great especially when you have the institutional capacity to do it and the institutions are supporting you um what we mm -hmm. just heard what Reese just laid out <laughs> as the strategy is really the only strategy we have at this point because this is an emerging technology that we're trying to figure out how to work with and roll in the fact that you are conducting this behind the scenes warfare with these institutions just underscores the point that it's very difficult for individuals to beat 
institution. I mean, alchemy is neutral. You can have good alchemy, mm. you can have bad alchemy. Clearly, they're mm -hmm. involved in bad alchemy. They're conjuring, but they have the benefit of institutions that have never been uh, in our favor. So, they, of course, they're not going to work. There's a certain in, there's certain institutional inertia that works against us. So what we have to do is do some good conjuring, like what Reese is saying. Engage, move right. forward. The problem is, however, that that is time-consuming. So when you mm -hmm. put that screen up and it said limited originality of content, that means that these white nationalists, in tandem with the white nationalists who are subsidizing them, the RNC rolling out this uh, however many millions of dollars they're putting behind the digital get-out-the-vote stuff, all this stuff is working against a one-man operation that can only continue to overwhelm that institutional capacity with the help of the rest of us. That's why we mm -hmm. got to financially support Roland Martin Unfiltered so that whatever Facebook is doing until you can cave their chest in on this is neutralized by the people who are putting two or three, four dollars on this thing every week, 10, 15, 50 dollars a year. And then they look up and say, well, we can't stop that. Yeah, you don't have no alchemy for that because we're going to use right. the good alchemy. We have to use all of our strategies and ten. Mm -hmm. uh, Erica, go right ahead, and then uh, I'm going to drop some breaking news in a second. Go ahead. Okay, and great. And just to kind of add to what Reese and uh, Greg have said, also, you just think about who are the architects of these algorithms. They're largely white men. When we look at the data that supports Silicon Valley and what that makeup looks like, um, and thinking about all of the women who have been working from home, where you see that workforce has been reduced because of um, responsibilities that they have assumed at home, now removed from that place, it is largely ran by white men. And we all know that Mark Zuckerberg is no stranger, not only to Donald Trump, but to the White House as well. So the onus is on us. We've never really had protections as black people. It's always been for us as a collective to make sure that we move and fight. And this is just another um, battle war, unfortunately, that we have to fight as well, the digital war. Hard, folks. Uh, Got to go to break. We come back. I'm going to share with you some breaking news from the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law regarding voting in Ohio. Uh, and also, Princeton University renames a building after racist Woodrow Wilson. We'll tell you the African-American who is going to be honored. That's next to Roller Martin Unfiltered. You want to support Roller Martin Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. as Roller Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roller Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. I'm utilizing what I know. I'm being able to speak about something that I used to didn't do that I can say, yeah, that was me, but it's okay. It's okay now because I know better now and you can too. I'm able to say that so they can relate to what I'm saying so I can capture their attention and be able to knock on their door and say, hey, you with me? And now they feel more opt to pay attention and more opt to be able to go out there and say, oh, well, just maybe because she said, and I'm a fan of hers, so the connection is, well, okay, what do I have to lose? Because sitting at home is what you're losing out on. And a lot of them don't even know how important the vote is. It's like, well, you know what, if I don't, you know, nobody going to miss my vote. Until you have a 50-50 share and it's 49 and 51 and you're like, oh. Then you got to feel like an ASS and go, see. All right, the folks at Seek.com, black-owned company founded by Mary Spio. Uh, they, of course, are a virtual reality company. You can check out their content at Seek.com, C-E-E-K.com. You can do so, of course, with these VR headsets. You can look at it, of course, on your regular device or your pad or your computer. But if you want to experience being in the room, you can use this headset right here. All you simply do is just pop in your cell phone in here, pop it on, and then uh, put this headset on, and you can literally experience their content in virtual reality. 
reality. And so uh, allows for you to do a 360 degree view uh, of the room. But also, folks, uh, you they have the 360 degree 4D headphones right here. Uh, these are, are Bluetooth headphones. Uh, they have complete surround sound in terms of as you hear the particular music. Uh, gamers love them as well when they're playing their games. Uh, and so it just phenomenal, phenomenal bass in these headphones as well. You can get one or both devices at seek.com using this promo code RMVIP2020, RMVIP2020. So we certainly thank the folks at seek.com for being a partner with us here at Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, folks, uh, this is the breaking news uh, I was talking about. Uh, just a few moments ago, Kristen Clark, uh, she posted this on her Twitter feed. Breaking victory secured in Ohio over Secretary La, La, Rose, La Rose's unlawful and discriminatory rule banning counties from having more than one drop box. This ruling benefits voters across Ohio, especially those in Cuyahoga County and other population centers will keep fighting to protect. And so they have uh, right here uh, the uh, the actual uh, motion uh, that was granted. Uh, the court granted uh, this and this is of course what it says here. Um, uh, while the secretary has maintained the problem in Cuyahoga County and the plan the Cuyahoga County Board adopted is not part of this litigation over drop boxes, the court disagrees. The Cuyahoga County Board only voted for its plan to deploy staff to receive ballots off-site because the secretary had prohibited off-site drop boxes. It is clear throughout this litigation that the main rationale behind that prohibition was the secretary's now rejected interpretation of Ohio law. He believed Ohio law limited personal delivery to board premises. The Ohio Court of Appeals said there is no such limitation. The secretary is continuing to restrict boards from implementing off-site collection and he appears to be doing so in an arbitrary manner. This is the kind of stuff that we're seeing, the kind of voter suppression tactics, Greg, that we're seeing in these by the, led by Republicans. They want to keep people from voting. We showed video yesterday of long lines in uh, Columbus, long lines in Harris County. They wanna frustrate people. They wanna make them stay in line for two, three, four, five, six hours. Hopefully they can wear them down and they, they just give up and go home. That is their goal. Said, I mean, Dublin, where, they, where Vanilla Ice is plotted this is, in the, is the Columbus, Ohio suburb. And as we were talking earlier, when I mentioned that, Frank LaRosa said, oh, multiple boxes? No problem. They got to be on site. So kudos to Kristen. Kudos to those women and men in the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, because as you said, Roland, that fits seamlessly to what we were talking about 20 minutes ago. They won the battle. No, you don't have to have uh, all those drop boxes on the actual site, because that's how they were going to try to do it. And again, it's a war of attrition, everybody. We have to continue to fight. That is the bottom line. If we don't, yeah. we'll lose. See what I find That's to be right. what I find to be interesting here, Eric. Erica is uh, is uh, the, the Secretary of State tried to get cute, and so Cahoe County said, "Oh, okay, no Dropbox, we'll send staff." And then he's like, "No, no, no." And they're like, "Wait, wait, wait, wait hold up." <laughs> See again, though. Oh, y'all said the box isn't secure. They already work for us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. And this is the check that we have been talking about. This is how you have to check Republicans because, see, the Republican Party, they are the party of oppression. So at every angle, when you think about uh, the right to vote, when we think about just the right to citizenship um, and how that has really been um, um, blocked, we think about it politically, we, we think about, I think about at least the Republican Party, so that the Republican Party um, and Secretary of uh, in this in this instance, um, that they were actually checked. This is what you need, and this is why elections matter. This is why it's important to pay attention, uh, not just what's happening on the national level, but to pay attention to the people that are state executive leaders um, and local leaders as well, because particularly if they're aligned with folks um, who um, are party oppressionists, then you're going to see that kind of trickle down economics happen throughout. Um, your state and in, within your local community. So um, very excited that Ohio Ohioans will continue to be able uh, to vote and vote in a very safe way. And this is what we need to continue to push to do. We need to support folks like the friend of the sh uh, friend of the show, Kristen Clark, um, and her or her organization, what she's doing, and that she has a place to come and she's able to talk about that freely, which is here on Roland Martin Unfiltered. 
um, and uh, support Roland Martin Unfiltered as well, because this is how messaging gets out. They're constantly doing this work on a daily basis. If you look at the Twitter feed, this is democracy um, helping to make sure that there's some semblance of democracy uh, continues to go forward. The people that are behind the scenes doing the work, like Kristen Clark, are folks that we need to support. So um, I just would encourage everybody to please continue to pay attention to what's happening in your state as we are 25 days out for one of the most important elections of our lifetime. Reese, see, this is what Kristen Clark tweeted. Why was this discriminatory? Cuyahoga County, 850,000 registered voters. Franklin County, 850,000 registered voters. Vinton County, 8,300 mostly white voters. Under this scheme, they all get one drop box. This ban had a particular stark impact on black voters in Ohio's major population centers. Right. I mean, and that's the point. They do not win without voter suppression. I also want to shout out, though, um, Sherilyn Eiffel of the uh, NAACP Legal Defense Fund. One of the things that I've been doing, and I don't contribute a lot, but $5, $10 here and there to these organizations that are on the forefront. I know that you have uh, ACLU and things like that, but we need to also make sure that we're supporting pr primarily Black-oriented uh, legal organizations and civil rights organizations because they are on the front lines of these very important fights. And we have to make sure that we're staying on top of it. Again, when it goes back to the curation and the algorithms, make sure you're following Kristen Clark. Make sure you're following Cheryl and Eiffel. Make sure you're following the NAACP legal defense funds because these, these things might not be reported on your local news. We know we have Sinclair Broadcasting, which is owned by Republicans, which is not necessarily invested in getting this information out. So we have to make sure that we're armed with as much information. We have to have a voting plan, A, B, C, and D. And this election is going to be heavily tilted with absentee ballots. And so the way that people make sure they have the right postage and how they return it, or if they have a drop box to return it, whichever method that you use, make sure that you're planning for it and that you're, you're staying on top of what your options are. And while things are good, when you're winning a, a, a ruling like this, get out to that drop box because these rules kind of go back and volley back and forth depending on which next court challenges it. So make sure that while things are good, if signature requirements are going away, like in South Carolina, then they come back. If drop boxes come, go away and come back, take advantage of it when it's happening at that time because it's only going to be even more of an intense fight all the way up to November. All right, folks, Princeton University will rename a building that was named for Woodrow Wilson, the U.S. president who uh, imposed segregation on the federal government in the lead up to World War I with that of a black graduate, Melody Hobson. Uh, she, of course, has made a sizable donation uh, for the new construction of the building. Hobson is the co-chief executive of Aerial Investments, the first black-owned investment firm, uh, actually a mutual fund, uh, the money which is coming from Ms. Hobson personally and from the Hobson Lucas Family Foundation. Her husband is, of course, uh, producer, director George Lucas. They will create the Hobson College, which will replace a dormitory complex known until this summer as Wilson College. Uh, the reality, Greg, Woodrow Wilson was one of the most violent racists we've ever had in the White House. Uh, he, of course, came after that racist Herbert Hoover was in the White House. Uh, we've had numerous races that have served in the United States uh, in, in uh, the White House, serving as president, including the current occupant. Uh, and But uh, I'm glad to see uh, the pressure that was brought to bear there at Princeton uh, to take down all of these living symbols uh, to these racists and white supremacists. Of course, the other folks was like, oh, no, we should leave these things up because, no, nah, damn that. Okay, what this man did, especially by showing birth of a nation in the White House, uh, uh, he deserves to lose any and all honors. Oh, no question. Well, if, if we're going on what who deserves and who don't deserve, I mean, we talking about Harvey Weinstein today. Thomas Jefferson named me to come down off everything. And while we at it, let's go get George Washington. And that's what they're scared of. But guess what? That awful day, as they say in the church, will certainly come. All them names yes, coming yes. at some point. It may take us 50 more years. But, you know, really, you know, respect to Melody Hobson, to, uh, to her husband, George Lucas, to the Hobson uh, and the Hobson Lucas Foundation and to Melody Hobson. That's a big deal at a place like Princeton. You know, I spent yes. a lot of time in that little college town. You know, my buddies Eddie Gloud and Monty Perry on the faculty there in African American Studies. You know, Woodrow Wilson, who was president of Princeton, I think, from 1902 to 1910, mm -hmm. eight years Wilson was a Wilson was a real racist, and Princeton was known as the Southern Ivy. 
you know, when you read Craig Stephen Wilder's book, Ebony and Ivy, this is the place where when James Madison went there, he brought the African he had captive and they had rooms for the enslaved Africans for the boys from the South, who used to be an all-male school, to come to Princeton. So for Melanie Hobson to have not just her name on a building, but to literally be building from the ground up what will become Hobson College? Look, mm -hmm. Michelle Obama ain't got no name on, on a building at Princeton, and she went to Princeton. Sonia Sotomayor ain't got no name on a building at Princeton. This this is a true paradigm shift for uh, the one-time Southern Ivy League school called Princeton. Uh, money, money, money. Um, yes, sir. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, folks, uh, of course, uh, we lost uh, another one of our uh, black entertainers, Johnny Nash, uh, from Houston, best known for his 1972 hit, I Can See Clearly Now, passed away on Tuesday morning at the age of 80. The reggae and pop music singer-songwriter died from natural causes at his home in H-Town, according to his son, John Nash. Nash began his career as a pop singer in the 1950s and the 1960s. He and his partner formed J.A.D. Records, and while living in Jamaica, the pair signed Bob Marley and other members of the group The Wailers. I can see clearly now the number one uh, hit number one on the Billboard Hot 100 on November 4th, 1972, and stayed in the top spot for four weeks. According to Billboard, the song returned to the Billboard charts when it was recorded by Jamaican reggae star Jimmy Cliff for the 1993 Cool Runnings movie soundtrack. According to his website, Nash was one of the first non-Jamaican singers to record reggae music in Kingston, Jamaica. In addition to his son, John, he's survived by his daughter, Monica, and wife, Carly Nash. They are certainly in our thoughts and prayers. All right, y'all, going to a quick break. We back. Final, final segment on Roller Martin Unfiltered. Hi, this is Dionne Warwick. You have just one vote. You better go ahead and use it, okay? All right, folks, uh, again, 25 days until Election Day. We want to show you... Er, the deadlines, early, vo excuse me, voter registration. Uh, here it is here. Today, of course, uh, is October 8th. Uh, the deadline tomorrow. And no, listen to me, our people, especially in New York State. I ain't that many of us in Idaho, let's just be honest. Uh, Oklahoma, but especially North Carolina. Tomorrow is the deadline for North Carolina. Saturday in Delaware. Uh, then, of course, October 13th is Washington, D.C. Kansas. Why is Kansas important? The Democratic candidate for the United States Senate in Kansas, she is up five points against the Republican. Trust me, Reese, Democrats will be shocked if they could mm -hmm. pick up a Senate seat in Kansas. Folks, Minnesota is crucial. Uh, lots of races there in rural Minnesota. They, Donald Trump uh, thinks that they think they can win Minnesota. Uh, so you have, that's why he spent so many time going to rallies there. You got New Jersey, Oregon, Virginia, and West Virginia. Your vi Virginia is critical because you've got some key races there. Cameron Webb, Dr. Cameron Re Webb, Gre uh, Greg, an alpha brother of ours, uh, could be elected to the United States Congress uh, from that particular uh, state as well. And so those deadlines are coming up in Wisconsin, October 14th. All of our folks in Milwaukee, uh, there. Be sure to get registered. Uh, we also know that they're not going to be using the Milwaukee basketball arena for early voting location for the voting location because Republicans were trying to essentially challenge them. What they said is that the deadline and this is the games they play. The deadline of voting locations was supposed to be published by June 12th. Well, the NBA and others did not, they did not come to an agreement until September 1st. So the Republicans were going to try to argue that any votes cast at the basketball arena could be invalidated because of that June 12th posting. So the folks in um, Milwaukee said, forget it, we're not even gonna use the arena, but those are the kind of games that are being played by Republicans when it comes to voting. Uh, lastly, uh, let's talk about this here. Uh, Erica, uh, Donald Trump was on Fox and Friends whining and complaining. Uh, the debate commission said because of coronavirus that he was not, they were not going to have uh, a de debate. They were going to make it a virtual, uh, in-person debate. They were going to make it a virtual debate. Well, uh, Donald Trump, uh, Mr. Moan saying, well, I don't want to do that. I might as well, you know, I might as well not stay at home. And so then all of us, so then the Biden campaign said, fine, uh, we're going to sit here, move the debate to October 22nd and 29th. And then Trump said, fine, we can do that. And Biden camp said, ah, the hell with that. 
uh, final debate is October 22nd. They've already agreed with ABC News to hold a town hall on October 15th to air that night. But here's what's interesting. All of a sudden, uh, Donald Trump, now his doctor comes out, okay, and drops this statement here, uh, his memorandum from the president's physician uh, saying uh, uh, in terms of what his condition is. This is from Sean Conley. Uh, Today, the president has completed his course of therapy for COVID-19 as prescribed. Now, remember all that stuff he was saying with HIPAA? Oh, he couldn't reveal anything, but all of a sudden now he can reveal personal information. Now, he, mm. he, he, he couldn't do it uh, uh, the other day. He couldn't do it on Monday, but he can somehow do it today. And so this is what, so now they're basically clearing him by Saturday to get back out there. And so you know what's going to be? Well, I'm healthy now to, to, to have a debate. Nah, it's too late. Uh, and so uh, that's where we stand again. Joe Biden said, I'm not waiting on y'all. He is going to be holding a town hall on ABC. What we're dealing with here, Erica, again, a desperate individual who is bleeding in the polls. He's trying to stop it. Mm-mm. Nah, bruh. We about to leave no doubt. We about to whoop yo ass at the polls and leave you to pay your 421 million dollars in debt that you got to come up with in the next four years you know when we think about this active virus that wants to continue to travel about the country let him go do it just make sure my people aren't there make sure that the folks that are essential workers um not like kaylee mcganey which she said that in a tweet that she herself was an essential worker no ma'am i'm talking about the people that work these service industry jobs let him go and set that one third that continues to worship and fall at the throne of the son of a Klansman. Let him do that. But I think, again, it goes back to really kind of where we are. People have pretty much made up their mind. And this is really about turning out folks who are unregistered in the base for the Democratic Party. So those efforts should be focused there, right? Not really trying to bring mm-hmm. in people, these imaginary people that are supposed to be helping cross the finish line. No, 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 no. It's more of us than it is of them. Focus on those groups. And I think that Reese mentioned this in one of her tweets, um, talking about, you know, protect Senator Harris at all costs so that to the extent that Senator Harris nor Vice President, former Vice President Joe Biden do not have to be around um, mediocre Mike or the son of a Klansman, or anybody that's within that orbit of infection, um, to please, in fact, do that and just really uh, concentrate and and buckle down on um, talking and connecting to people that are really suffering, all of us, um, dearly under this leadership and uh, these multitude of crises. Also, uh, your thoughts on that, Reese, but also last night, 58 million second most watched vice presidential debate in U.S. history only behind uh, the uh, 69 million uh, that was there watched in 2008 with Joe Biden and Sarah Palin. It's the Kamala effect. And, you know, a lot of the pod bros and the white bro checks on uh, Twitter like to say how nobody's going to remember it. Uh, Hell no. This is a historic night. And Senator Kamala Harris showed that black women are competent and ready to take their seat at the table. So it was absolutely memorable. And people wanted to see that she delivered. She's the overwhelming winner in all of the polling that I've seen. But to um, to the other point about, um, first of all, we can't trust anything that this doctor says, because this is the same doctor that, that released a physical report on Donald Trump in the summer that said that he took hydroxychloroquine for two weeks to prevent COVID. So he has no credibility. <laughs> No credibility yeah. whatsoever. I don't even know if I believe that he's taking the drugs that he says he's taking because he has financial stake in it and he's touting it as a miracle drug. So he is not a person that should be believed independently. Nothing that this White House administration does is anything more than propaganda. Even with mm-hmm. the whole them asking the CDC director, Robert Redfield, to sign off on Mike Pence, what the CDC said is we consulted with Mike Pence's doctor and we basically took their word for everything that they said. So what Donald Trump is right now is desperate. They're bleeding money. They're canceling ad buys in Ohio and Iowa and other states that he needs to win because they are significantly behind in the money race. Washington Post has an article out tonight that Republicans are starting to distance themselves from mm-hmm. Donald Trump 
these Republicans are going to switch gears and put their money towards these Senate seats, like in Kansas, like in Alaska, where the Democrat there is gaining, and all across the country. And they're going to write off Donald Trump. So he ha is desperate to get back out there. And truthfully, there is he's completely idiotic to have turned down an opportunity to talk to 50 million people, even though we know he will lose the debate again because he doesn't have the money to compete on the airwaves. So that's why we see this big rush for Donald Trump to try to get back out there again. He's a narcissist, but he needs the exposure because he's not going to win the money race and the, um, and the, and the, the ad race. Uh, Greg, uh, final thoughts on, uh, again, uh, you know, where we are, state of this race, uh, and, and the sheer desperation uh, of Donald Trump. Republicans, man, uh, they look like uh, rats uh, scurrying left and right uh, because they see what is happening. They look at these numbers. Uh, Raphael Warnock, uh, now in the race with Kelly Leffler, uh, tops both her and, uh, and Doug Collins, meaning that goes to a runoff. It's going to be him versus Leffler or Collins. Then you talk about Cal Cunningham up five points in North Carolina. The, the Republican Democrat up five points in Kansas. Uh, Mark Kelly is up 12 points uh, in Arizona. You have uh, the Democrat who's running against John Cornyn down one, 47-46. You have the woman who's running against Susan Collins. Collins, Sarah Gideon, she is up uh, seven or eight points. You've got the woman, I can't remember her name, who's running against Jody Ernst. She's up 12 against Ernst in Iowa. And so Democrats uh, look, I mean, could very well be in the Ossoff, race, Ossoff Purdue race in Georgia, has flipped Ossoff, mm -hmm. uh, is now on top there as well. Again, I tell everybody as well polls are not votes. Uh, but again, right. what you're seeing is every day Donald Trump does another infomercial for Regeneron, uh, talking about uh, how God blessed him with getting COVID. All he's doing is just pissing off more of these people who have seen folks die. And all I keep saying mm -hmm. is, brother, keep talking. Orange mm -hmm. man, keep talking. Because the more you talk, the more your ass going to lose. Mm -hmm. Rolling. When he came out with that video yesterday looking like Man Tan Moreland or Burt Williams. <laughs> <laughs> Man, what the hell? But 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 I, but, I, but I tell you what though, listen, I'm listening to Reese and I'm listening to Erica and and have been listening, of course, to you say this over and over again. We have to run through the tape. That's Remember right. that awful night when we were at the restaurant in 2016. And you did that live mm -hmm. coverage, and it got deeper in the night, and everybody began to realize what the hell was happening. Yeah. <laughs> look here. Look, as far as we are concerned, we need to act like everybody is one point down, and your vote is going to mm -hmm. be the one to make the difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't ignore them all. Break Kelly Loeffler's whole political back. All these little <laughs> memes she's putting out with Donald uh, yeah. Trump fighting coronavirus, and while he got this little momentary high from these steroids, Ignore it all. Break her back. If the Atlanta Dream, the team she owns, if these sisters yes. can stand up tall and say, mm -hmm. go to hell to the woman who pays, writes their check, the least That's we can right. do is act like she's ahead by three points. Got to run right. through the tape. Eric and mm -hmm. laid it out. And look, because this dude right here, I'm looking at Tiz James in New York, and I'm saying Tiz James is, <laughs> is the Erica Savage of attorney generals. This yes. man going to jail. <laughs> and so, and when I hear Reese lay out strategy, look, Reese is right. They're running scared. Yes. But guess what? Mm -hmm. We should now, that's not the moment for us to just stand back. We need to right. remember that election night in 2016 and act like everybody's seat is in danger. We got to run through mm -hmm. the tape. This well, again, and, I, and, and, and that's the key. I want people to understand uh, that what we have to do is we have to be laser-like focus on all of this. And I'm talking about, that's what I'm saying. I don't, I don't make no assumptions. I think a lot of black people made assumptions uh, in Florida when Andrew Gillum was show, posed with showing him up and folks took it easy. No, you can get all the rest you want after. And I say vote yes. vote so steadily that that the, ball the ballots, uh, the mail-in ballots won't be able to save his ass. That's where we gotta be, Reese. Absolutely. I mean, I think personally, I do think it's going to be a blowout. But I said earlier today on the Clay Kane show, listen, I'm confident, but I'm not complacent. We have to, as Dr. Carr said, and I'm glad he said it first, so I don't have to steal from him. 
break their political backs. Okay, yeah. that is our, our only option. A lot of these absentee ballots are going to be the first ballots that come in. These early votes are going to be the first ballots that come in. It's changed to where before the absentee ballots were cast were counted last or they were counted the same night as election night. In a lot of places, these are going to be, we're going to know the tallies the second that the polls close. And so we have to get our votes in. We have to vote properly. Black people, we mm -hmm. are just as intelligent as white people. So there's no reason why our ballots are getting rejected four right. times more for user error, things like signatures and things like that. They're looking for anything. So we have to be very thorough in what we're doing so that our votes count. If we do that, then we'll win and we'll win big and we'll win unequivocally. And we won't have to be talking about how we, the, the election was stolen from voter suppression because black voters had a higher rejection rate. Let's do everything that we can in our power to make sure that our votes count. Uh, y'all, y'all remember this scene from Remember the Titans? I've been telling y'all. You brought us here, Coach. Yeah. Running in, coming, leave no doubt. Run it up, Herman, leave no <laughs> doubt. That's what I've been telling y'all. Hashtag leave no doubt. You know, mm -hmm. since, since Orange Man dropped this little video, <laughs> I, 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 I had to go ahead. Matter of fact, he ain't even orange anymore. He burnt orange. He let the University of Texas colors. Uh, he, he burnt orange. And, 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 and he burnt orange. And so it the, really is. And so, uh, and so the Lincoln Project <laughs> dropped another video, uh, and they had to go ahead and reach back to all them crazy white conservative evangelicals uh, who were praying for Trump. Y'all ready for this? Please. I execute judgment on you, COVID-19. Hold on. I caught it. Anybody in here a person of faith? Let's all pray. We should pray. We pray. Say a prayer. We pray. Pray. Let's pray. Earnest prayer. Let's pray. I brought my Bible. God walks on White House grounds. You need to send in that three thousand, thirty-five thousand, hundred thousand dollar check. You're gonna write your checks to Paula White Ministry. In the name of Jesus. Oh. I don't do a lot of things that are bad. Let pride fall. I try and do nothing that's bad. Let pride fall. I don't like to have to ask for forgiveness. Absolutely and hallelujah. Every life brings love into this world. We command all satanic pregnancies to miscarry right now. Woe to the nation that calls evil good. So I think this was a blessing from God. And calls good evil. Ah, ah. Oh, I had to go in the show on that one. If y'all want to join our Bring the Funk fan club, we need y'all support. Uh, every dollar you give goes to support what we do. Uh, let me give a shout out right here uh, to Donna Mitchell, uh, Phyllis Hayes, uh, Hobbs and Hobbs Trucking Service. I appreciate it. Uh, I Bell Boast, B-O-S-T. Thank you so very much. Elva Buford, uh, Sherry Harris, uh, Corinne Erickson. Thank you so much. Author Ray Baker. Uh, also, Joyce Adams Watkins, thanks a lot. Uh, James Works uh, Jr., I appreciate it. Uh, let's see here. Who is this here? Lord, Carthalinta Cooper? I think I pronounced that right. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, let's see here. Ethel Schiller, I appreciate that. Eugene Carrington, thank you so very much. Uh, also, let's see here, uh, Lillian Financial, thank you very much. Uh, then also, we have uh, here, uh, Mr. Amos, I appreciate it, thank you so very much as well, uh, folks, support. Your course, cash out, uh, dollar sign RM Unfiltered, paypal.me, paypal.me forward slash R Martin Unfiltered, uh, Venmo.com is forward slash uh, RM Unfiltered. You can also send a money order uh, to New Vision Media, NU Vision Media, Inc., 1625 K Street Northwest, Sweet 400, Washington, D.C., 2006. And I have a few more names. Byron Edmund, Caribbean Giving Incorporated, Clifford Jones, Danielle LaRoche, Deborah Roney, Diva Empowered Magazine, Ebony Gully, Ed Harton, Joan Warren, Johnny Whitty, Kenneth Shaw, Leonard Chis Chislam, 
Leslie Ward, Lewis Jones, Madison Media Management LLC, Mavis Knight, Michael Smith, Michelle Mallory, Mitchell Brown, Oliver Huggins, Oslo Inc., Rosalind William Scott, Samuel Hooker, Sandra Dickey, Teresa Miller, Travis Everett, Ursula Hamilton, Vanessa Howard, Vanessa Mayers. Uh, and I think I got one more list. Hold on. Let's see. Uh, no Keenan sent it to me. Yes, here we go. A. Caraway, Alfred Dean, Alfred Searles Jr., Alan Patterson, Alvin Young. Anthony Terry, Antoinette Watson, Arnold Hogue. Those of you who are watching, of course, on YouTube, y'all can give right there. Avis Taylor, Buffini, uh, Silver, Barry Ward, Betty Saucer, Bridget uh, Washington, Bruce McAllister, C&G Dental Studio, Carmen Keeling, Celia Ingham, Claudia Cream, Cynthia Williams, Dana Johnson, Daniel LaRoche, De uh, Darren Kelly, Dolores Stalling, Dina Bowen, Denise uh, Hamio, Diva Empire Magazine, Don Scott, Donna Josie, uh, Priscilla Smith as well. Let's see here. Uh, do, 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 do. Ebony Gully, Ernest Mims, Eugenia Williams, Eula Patrice Wright, uh, Gloria Farlow, Gwendolyn Getty, Hugh York, Jay Hubbard, Janet Nelson, Janice Brooks, Jean Stewart, Jeffrey Loving, Jeffrey Scrivener, Johnny uh, Witte, Juanita uh, Fuseler, Juanita Sherwood, Kay Lambert, Karen Whitley, Kashonda, Kashonda Norman, Kathy Dean, Ken Freeman, Kenneth Capers, Kenneth Drayton, Kevin Brown, Kevin Perry, Christina Elliott, Loretta Jones, Leonard Chislam, Leslie Ward, Lucille Santos, Marilyn Bell, Mark Rawls, Marsha Stewart, Marshall Morrison, Maurice Perry, Melanie Tittle, uh, Michael Newkirk, Michael Smith, Michael Williams, Michelle Laylor, Michelle Mallory, Mr. and Mrs. Earl Faulkner, Oting, Wallaboa, Pamela Webb, Pamela, Pamela Williams, Pat McQueen, Peggy Voss, Ray, Renee Green, Renita Taylor, Robert Bradford, Robert Perro II, Rochelle Jordan, Ronald Miles, Ron Duel Tice, Ronnie West, Sanders Family Trust, Sandra Dickey, Cheryl Dugan, Sharon Franklin Brown, uh, Sharon Slayton, Shavar Jeffries, uh, Shondamel Day, Silas Kearns, Stacy Bright, Sylvia, Sylvia Lawhern, Tammy Murphy, Tanya Rambert, uh, Tessra Lawson, The Art of Poncho, Thomas Quick, Tony Lund, Travis Everett, Troy Boyd, Vanessa Howard, Vanessa Mayers, Walter Brooks, William Hardison, Young Express, AL. LLC. Uh, all of those folks uh, make it possible. We had a great post debate night conversation last night. Y'all, this is why your dollars matter to support what we do because we are about producing Facebook original damn content. <laughs> that speaks to our audience. That's what we're doing. And so, of course, we have great panels, great conversation. Uh, this is about informing our people. Information is power. And let me be real clear. You've heard me say this. Uh, you can go pull the, pull the panel back up, uh, uh, Anthony. This is the thing I need y'all to understand. We have enough damn entertainment in black America. Ooh, we are great. entertaining ourselves to death. Okay? Yes. yes, Tony Lanes, his ass got charged today for shooting Megan Thee Stallion. Got it. Tori, well, I don't, see right there. So when my Chelsea goes, Tori, I don't know. I don't give a damn about his name. Tori, Tony, <laughs> I don't give a shit. What I'm trying to say is this here. We got enough damn entertainment. And what I'm sick of, I'm sick of, and I have nothing against my black entertainers. I know many of them, but I'm sick and tired of black networks thinking and black websites thinking that the only way you can present information is if you have celebrities who are filling up most of the seats. All right, Greg, Reese, Erica, not, they don't, they ain't no singers, they ain't no dancers, they playing no instruments. They ain't here to sell no <laughs> records, no movie coming out. And again, nothing against them. But black people, we can educate our people without being so focused on saying it has to be entertainers. Right. And it drives me crazy when I see these black networks and that's what they do. Oh no, we can't do a news special, can't do anything unless we have some entertainers. Because what we're saying is if we don't have black folks who can dance and who can sing, then black folks not gonna wanna watch. That's a lie. Right. That's we're proving lie. it every single day. Our numbers are growing every single day. So the dollars that you give go to support everything that we do with this show. We're going to have a post-debate. Uh, First of all, there's no debate next week. Uh, but that final debate, October 22nd, we're going to be here. And we are planning a major election night coverage. And I'm not going to announce it yet. But our entire election night coverage is going to be simulcast on a radio network. All eight hours. Nothing. See, that's what happens when you own your shit. 
You're not having to Period. ask somebody else, please, pretty please, can we do this? And so, mm -hmm. we are about controlling the message, presenting our people. We're gonna have the best covers that night. Y'all might as well go ahead and plan it. Tell, I want y'all to tell all your family, do what Greg did if they family get together. Last time they got together last year, teach all your uncles and your aunts and your grandmother and your grandfather and your mamas and daddies how to pull the show up, how to put That's it on right. a big screen. You don't want them to sit. They don't want to sit around watching their phone. Show them how to put the show on a big screen. They ain't got to watch CNN and MSNBC and ABC and CBS and Fox News. We are going to have real, authentic, black discussion on election night and nobody else is going to come close. I did, and when I say nobody else, that includes every black network, other black websites, other black newspapers and black magazines. Nobody's gonna do what we do. Trust me, y'all do not wanna miss it. And yes, I'm gonna have a black caterer there that night with some pound cake and... Uh, <laughs> Not the pound cake. With some pound cake and peach cobbler for the staff. That's how black yes, we're going to be on election night. Greg, yes, sir. <laughs> Greg, Reese, uh, Erica, I appreciate it. <laughs> Folks, yes, I'm rocking. Uh, I got, I, I'm wearing, just so y'all, I, I figured it out. I'm wearing nothing but election shirts between now and election day. Yesterday was shut up and vote. Sister from Dallas sent to me tonight. The folks at Be Woke Vote uh, sent me this, uh, and they sent me this, a hat and a hoodie as well. And so uh, that's what I'm rocking. Uh, that's what I'm rocking today. And so I got something else tomorrow. Uh, and hey, that shirt um, uh, Regina Bell had on, uh, Vote with the V in blood. Yeah, you know they sent that to me. I'm going to be rocking that one too. So I appreciate it, folks. I'm going to see y'all tomorrow. We got to go. Ha!